Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we're just going to give our fellow PAVR members a couple minutes to log on. Uh, it's just about 12.01, so we'll give them until 12.03 to log on, and then we'll get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our PABRA members and our guests. I want to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon. And I really hope you're all enjoying the summer and we appreciate that you've taken the time to join us today. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. We will be recording the webinar this afternoon and uh, that recording should be available online probably within the next week or so. You should get an email notification about that. And uh, we're going to be leaving about 10 minutes or so at the end of the webinar for any questions that you may have. So just feel free to send those in throughout the webinar when you think of something that you'd like to ask. And you can just do that through the chat box um, on the bottom of the screen. If you're having any tech problems, just send me a message and I'll, I'll do my best to, to help you through that as well. So our webinar today is entitled A Little Story Goes a Long Way. And I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Nancy Angus. Nancy is a longtime Thunder Bay resident. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Lakehead University and has obtained certificates from the Ryerson University in Gerontology and the University of Victoria in Adult and Continuing Education. After 35 years in the workforce with roles in seniors recreation, volunteer management, and freelance writing and broadcasting, she has launched a new business called Age Big, which won the Social Innovation Challenge for 2019. As a speaker, blogger, storyteller, community connector, and workshop facilitator, Nancy engages individuals and audience to age big. That's boldly, inquisitively, and gratefully. So uh, I'd like to welcome Nancy, and I'll just I'll just throw it over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, yes, this is uh, Age Big. Uh, that's the name of my business. And I also kind of think it's um, a really perfect way of, of thinking about uh, what we do as volunteer managers and as volunteers. We really do stand out in a crowd, and um, that is what uh, we are able to do. Um, I have been very fortunate in my career um, to have been able to share stories um, but mostly listen to people and get their stories. They've been telling me a lot of things over the years and I've had experience to be able to share those with um, either in writing in magazines or periodicals or working on CBC radio to share those stories to a lot larger audience. 
But what I'm really used to doing, and I'm hoping that you will help me out with this, I love talking to groups because I love to see the interaction. So I can't see you guys today. So I hope that you're waving back at me and, uh, um, you know, trying to kind of give me a little bit of a rah-rah along the way. Um, I feel that what I'm going to have to do today is kind of try to hook you with uh, the inflection in my voice. Um, I'm going to share some photos with you, um, but I hope that the words that I'm going to share today, the words that I'm saying, the words that I'm putting up on the screen, those are might be the words that cause you to, um, to listen. Um, I want you to recognize that um, you have a story, um, your volunteers have a story, and your agency has many people within it that has stories to share. So um, thanks to Michelle for this invitation and to Pavro for inviting me. And um, uh, let's see how we can all stand out by telling a few stories. So does that sound good so far? You can all give me a thumbs up. So here's what we're going to do. What I hope to do today is really what we've been um, build this little talk today is to learn to gather and share the stories of volunteers. And that concludes you if you ever do any volunteer work, which I'm sure everybody in the group does. So first of all, we're going to look at your own personal stories because um, sometimes those are the ones that uh, are really where we can get to um, understand how we can kind of bring some of those stories out of our volunteers. Um, I want you to take a couple of minutes to maybe do a little work on your own to share a personal story. Then we'll have some time to prepare, tell and share stories, including and mainly focusing on stories for our workplace where we can recruit, retain, recognize and respect our volunteers. So. And I also like to think sometimes there's um, the five R's in, uh, you know, with recycling. So I like to think about recruiting, retaining, recognizing, respecting volunteers, but also think about sometimes we recycle um, the stories that we can tell about volunteering. And uh, that's really good because your stories are portable. No matter what agency you work for, you can still kind of take your stories with you. So think about the stories that you kind of gather and share. You can actually recycle. So what I want to do is, in, we're talking a little bit about storytelling, but storytelling has a huge kind of opportunity and there's a lot within the kind of storytelling genre that we're going to kind of delve into today in a few minutes. But if you look at the Wikipedia definition, we can look at um, a wide variety of areas. You can look at social and cultural activity of sharing stories. Um, a lot of times we see people using improv or um, theater or somehow kind of building up a story, including um, stories that are told through traditional means, maybe in theater, but also um, areas that are um, shared with puppets and that type of thing. And every culture throughout time has had its own narratives and the stories that they've shared either through pictographs, through oral storytelling, um, through fathers, grandparents, passing them along to grandchildren. Um, and they can be entertainment, as all of us have, have uncles that are fishermen or fisherwomen. They will tell us stories that um, are embellished perhaps a little bit. Um, but we can also learn a lot about um, where we are in in our world by um, by some of the, the the traditional stories that have been passed along through the years. And then if you really are thinking about writing a story as if you were um, working as an author, then you would really look at breaking it down into plot, character, and narrative point of view. Much bigger. And again, I think a lot of us get kind of caught up in storytelling or stories um, because we've all gone through our school system where you start to uh, get marked on how you write and your grammar kind of can get in the way and you can start to um, tighten up as opposed to being really loose with telling a story or writing a story. And what I hope we can do today is get you to kind of be a little bit freer in how you can share the stories and not worry about getting a mark for them. Um, 
and also a lot of what we're using now too and and what i've developed through my career is an opportunity to to work on storytelling through the experience that i've had working on um, shows like uh, cbc radio's morningside with peter zosky which um, i took a story and would be able to tell it based on what was happening around in in thunder bay so so, so far, that's a little bit about the specifics of story, um, you know, kind of the, the basics. But I want to give you a little bit about me, um, because um, who doesn't like to talk about themselves, right? And uh, this can be a really difficult thing for us to do, because um, so often we are uh, all about telling about talking about other people, especially as volunteer managers. But sometimes I think if you kind of bring it in, and here's where I'd like you to do your first little piece of thinking on your own, is if you had to kind of tell a couple of stories about how um, a volunteer experience has impacted you, or um, something that maybe you did as a child where you really could see um, the main causes in your life that you really wanted to champion um, how did those things kind of come about when you were a child so i'm going to tell you two stories here um, i'm going to start with uh that's me on the left with long hair that was a picture taken a few years ago um, but in thunder bay where i live uh, there used to be a television program and when we were kids when i was about grade two grade three grade four the program was sponsored by a company called Old Dutch Potato Chips. And what they would do is they would invite children to uh, collect box tops and chip bags uh, from around our you know, school, stores, neighborhoods. So we basically were garbage picking and getting our friends to share garbage bags or like old Dutch potato chip bags, and we would stack them. So in my basement, I had piles and piles and piles of uh, uh, potato chip bags. And all that you would kind of gather them up and you would get a certain number of points. So when I felt like I had enough points, I lined up at the TV station and went on a program called Kids Bids. And um, on that program on Kids Bids, I won a prize. And uh, so, I, yeah, I was probably grade four. So I was about 10 years old. I went up to the front and won my uh, Hardy Boys book and a slinky. And the person that was the host of the television program said to me, do you realize you've won a boys prize? And um, it didn't make any difference to me. I was so proud of the fact that my chip bags were actually used to buy something. And I was on TV with that crazy thing. So the story is that um, that was my first little um, experience in um, an opportunity to raise awareness of uh, a sponsor uh, for the first place, but also we were garbage picking. We were picking up garbage. We were um, picking up litter long before I think it was a trendy thing to do. So uh, just a funny little kind of uh, story about me and where I came from. Um, the second picture here on the right hand side is a person some of you may recognize that was Pope John Paul II. And um, when we volunteer, we get into all sorts of opportunities that maybe wouldn't have been part of our life uh, beforehand. And um, when I worked in Toronto in 1984, when the Pope made a visit to Toronto, I was asked to, uh, or I was, I volunteered to help with a reception. And um, at that reception, uh, the uh, Pope came into the Toronto Convention Centre and uh, along with my fellow volunteers, we saw the Pope arrive in the Pope Mobile and get out of the Pope Mobile and then head to the escalator to go downstairs where uh, we could see him from far away, but here we were behind a barricade. And instead of going to the escalator, he turned and started walking towards us, which was quite something because um, First of all, I realized he wears makeup because he wears that white robe. So he was getting so close to us. I realized the first thing I kind of noticed is 
here's the Pope coming towards us. And he's got like, I'm sure he's got makeup on his face. And he was surrounded by all these really handsome um, uh, security guards. And um, as he came, then he took our hands and, you know, kind of uh, said something to us and, and walked along. And as he got closer and closer to me, my face got kind of frozen into this kind of um, uh, sneer where my, you know how sometimes your lips get stuck onto your teeth and you kind of make that kind of uh, like, it's, it looks like <laughs> it's a terrifying kind of look. Anyway, that's my Pope face. And so now whenever people kind of ask me about my experience with the Pope, they say, oh, can you make the Pope face? Because that's how you greeted the Pope and probably scared him or something. But, um, but again, that's just one of the stories or one of the opportunities that when we open ourselves up to volunteering, we can be, um, it, we can experience things that are so much more than uh, what we had thought of. So think about for yourself, what are some of your own personal stories? What has volunteering opened for you? Um, have you ever had an experience where you've learned about um, the environment through something that you did as a child? How have you ever um, created um, an opportunity or, or a memory in your head about uh, meeting someone that uh, you can't uh, get away from? A couple of weeks ago, I took a wonderful program in Toronto with Story or Storytelling Toronto, um, led by Marilyn Perringer. And what Marilyn did with us is um, was one of the best icebreakers that I've ever been part of. And what she asked us to do was um, uh, get people, we were all around the circle, and she asked us to tell us instead of like just introducing ourselves with our name, tell me a story about your name. So this is something that again, I think it's a really valuable icebreaker if you have an opportunity to meet with a group of people. Um, because one of the things is, you know, tell me a story about your how you got your first name or uh, what your last name means to you or do you have a nickname? And what I found from that experience as we kind of ran around the circle, as people kind of talked about, you know, the nicknames they had or the names that their father maybe wanted to call them, but they ended up getting another name. Um, it just created such a wonderful way of getting to know the people in the room and memorize, or not memorizing, but getting them to kind of open up a little bit more as um, opposed to just saying your name. But if you have the time to do that, it's a really great exercise and just thinking about how would you describe your first name? Um, is there a story with your last name? Is there something about that you, um, you know, that you always wanted to be called something else but your parents named you another name and you always in your, you know, whenever you went to school would use another name at school. Very interesting for what, what people can, um, can say and how you can learn something more about that person just from that little icebreaker. So often when we look at people and we look at volunteers, we may not know what the story is with those people. And um, I love to use a photo and most of us do in our social media campaigns or in any kind of recruitment that we're doing. Uh, we try to come up with some kind of caption that can encapsulate the story. So, but but because we know our own personal stories so well, but we don't know necessarily the story of our volunteers or the other people that we're working with. So we need to take the time to talk to these people and find out something about their stories. So these women on the, on the uh, screen here, on the left-hand side, um, they're both the same people. Like the, in the left-hand side, the woman in the green is my mother. Um, in that picture, she's 98. And her sister-in-law, my other aunt, Sis, is um, 104. And then you flash forward to the right-hand picture where my mother is, whoops, uh, my mother is 100, and 100 years old. And her sister-in-law is now 106. So if you have the um, great opportunity to be around some older people, uh, 
the stories are so rich in what people can pick out from what they remember, uh, what they've learned, uh, what they want to pass along. And the most poignant piece I have from my 106-year-old aunt that lives in Emo, Ontario, and we went to see her a couple of weeks ago. My mom and I drove, it's about four hours to drive to Emo. So I drove my mom up there and my aunt said, uh, it's so nice that you sit here and listen to me because she said at a 106 what she finds is that most people just kind of say oh how you doing and they're gone so what she likes is that someone takes the time to sit and talk and listen and maybe that's just the reminder that all of us need when we're going at such a breakneck speed at times is that when we ask someone how are you doing we have to be prepared to listen to them and the other tip that my mother goes my mother the hundred hundred year old she's almost 101 now what she says is um, ask somebody more than how are you doing ask them something uh, that gets them to converse about something like what do you think about the Blue Jays or um, you know uh, do you think they should have traded Kawhi Leonard from the Raptors I mean sports is pretty interesting for a lot of older people but be ready for the stories and uh, take the time to listen and see if you can kind of pick out something that may work into your um, volunteer kind of recruitment campaign This story is really important to me. This is um, a volunteer story can make a positive difference in the volunteer's life or in the life of someone who might read that story. Um, this story came to me when I was teaching at Confederation College. I was teaching a career readiness course and there was a student in the class that was really struggling. He really didn't feel like he had, that he was good at anything. So what kind of career was he really gonna kind of focus on? What kind of program was he gonna be able to do? And he was just sort of wasting his money. So uh, it took a little while, but um, finally he said that he had done some volunteer work when he was in high school because he had to do those 40 hours in Ontario. And um, one of the jobs that the volunteer manager gave him at that time was they were getting ready for um, an auction sale and they had a couple of pieces of furniture that they thought uh, would probably sell better if they'd refinished it. So that uh, young volunteer got the opportunity to focus on refinishing that donated furniture and he was so proud of the fact that they raised more money because of the work that he had done and as we kind of talked it out with him he realized that the one thing he was really good at that he had developed a skill in was in this um, opportunity to refinish furniture and he liked furniture so he thought that perhaps refinishing furniture carpentry uh, building uh, things with wood might be his career path. And so again, I think that story um, is so important to, to share because it really, um, the volunteer manager that rec recognized that, that in order to keep that guy there in the job, they needed to have something for him to do and it was just something that he really gravitated towards. Somebody mentored him so he could get better at it. And it made a huge impact in that one person's life. And also, every time I tell this story, I feel like by telling the story and repeating and recycling the story is that someone else will get that little, you know, kernel of information that can hopefully give them more inspiration because sometimes as any volunteer manager knows you get kind of tired when you have to quickly come up with a, um, a placement for somebody that has to do a quick 40-hour turnaround and uh, this was creative um, opportunity on everyone's part and especially life-changing for the volunteer. So I hope that if you think about right now, and this is just another opportunity for you to take your pencil out and kind of think about some of the things that you think how storytelling can help you to recruit, retain, and recognize your volunteers. 
what are some of those ways? What are some of the things that you think you can do? And why should you do them? When I think about it, I obviously always go to recruiting because I think what we do a lot of times when we talk about volunteer uh, recruitment is something that we're constantly doing every day, it seems. Uh, but there's other ways that we can kind of um, work our storytelling into the whole volunteer program course through recruiting by sharing those stories of volunteers and success stories and people that have uh, have made a difference like for example the fellow at Habitat. Volunteers might read it and our, our teacher might see it and they said I can see myself fitting into that organization. Um, I realize that I fit in because when I read the story or hear the story of someone else, I look like that person and that way I know that I'm going to be able to be accepted um, in that project. And then also if you're cause driven, the recruiting can be really important because if you hear the story, you say, this is important because I can see a difference, I can make a difference to what my cause is and I can fit into that volunteer organization because they're doing what I want to be part of. But also um, volunteer stories and the stories that we share can also help us in retaining people. And I think sometimes that's kind of surprising too, because it can be energizing. Even if a person gets asked to have a profile written about them, uh, that's energizing to the person, but it can also be energizing to the people on the team around them, including the staff members. Um, it can help people to open their eyes that there are new opportunities that may be uh, within the organization. So maybe they stay with the organization in some capacity, but because they've read about something new happening in another area, they might ask to switch over into that new opportunity. And so you're retaining the volunteer, but they're doing something new within the organization. And also I think retaining is really important because when you get a story, um, it can help people to develop new contacts. If they read about a particular volunteer in your organization doing something, they've got somebody new to talk about, they've got talking points, they can kind of break the ice, and that helps you build and retain a core group of, of people um, just through a simple story that you might share. Of course, when it comes time for recognition, of course, by sharing the volunteer stories, it's a lovely way of saying thank you to the people, but it also helps, again, in building connections in the community um, by recognizing some of our volunteers um, in the bigger community, uh, other people can make connections and recognize that maybe there's new partnerships that can be formed with agencies working together. And more and more we're seeing that happen where volunteer um, are sharing with other volunteer agencies and making those connections. So that sometimes can happen through sharing a story in a bigger, in a bigger format. And always I believe in any kind of um, in any kind of volunteer storytelling or in any kind of storytelling in particular, is that it's a respect um, feature, whether you ask permission uh, for every volunteer to share their story, um, you know, uh, specifically if you have a name attached, um, if you get a photo release for a photo that you're using, um, and also if the volunteer says, oh, I'd rather not share that story, or I don't want to be part of it, um, then that's really important too, but recognize that some of the stories you just keep to yourself, but you can use them for learning, but perhaps not for um, building your volunteer program. And sometimes I recognize that sometimes some people want to be quiet, but when they see how respectfully you might treat other people's stories, they may come back to you and say, you know what, I've, I've given it a thought and I really feel that my words can make a difference and I'd like you to share them. One of the projects I've been working on recently in Thunder Bay um, that has been really life-changing for me is a project called um, Age Friendly Giants. And um, we did some digital storytelling. Um, it's a seniors project. Um, then the uh, acronym stands for Grand Individuals Aging with Neighbors in Thunder Bay. Uh, but anyway, our giants uh, did a digital story storytelling where we worked with some of the facilitators from Story Center Canada. And 
Here's what they recommended as the storytelling seven. So this is again, something that you can take if you're doing a digital story, a written story, um, gathering your own personal story, is seven steps. So the first one is own your insights to your story. Own your emotions about that story. And sometimes remember, stories aren't always funny. There's a lot of emotion tied up in what you wanna kind of convey. Find your moment. And that's what one of the things when you have someone that you can maybe share a story with, um, by kind of talking it out, sometimes you find that moment where everything kind of comes together and you can kind of learn to edit, which is one of the most important things to be able to do is to edit your story. So once you kind of find that moment and you know what your story is gonna be about, you see your story in your mind's eye, you hear your story, you start to hear the kind of commentary that's coming together in the story. You pull together the, the pieces of the story, which would be assembling for a digital story, you're assembling some pictures and some audio and some words. But the last and most important part is to share the story. Because so often what people will do is get to the point where they assemble the pieces together but they don't share it. And I think what we do, what we really need to do is to really build up people's confidence to be able to share the story. So that's just a really quick little synopsis about um, putting together a digital story, but really thinking about how you edit and why you edit to be able to, to maximize the impact. Here is the key point. When I did this um, workshop in Ottawa just a couple of months ago at the Synergize conference, to me this was the most um, telling piece in the workshop where we got to, in a group, uh, I encourage people to take a minute and write a story. Uh, I want you to think about doing something like this on a basis of not being edited, not being um, worried about timing or anything like that, um, and just jot something down really quickly. And you will find, if you just follow the story selling spine, which is just a, um, a basis for, uh, you know, we're writing a long story or a short story or a podcast or a, um, Instagram post, it's almost like you pull something like this together and you can make magic happen. So um, I'm just encouraging you to take a minute, if you have a minute there, if you've got a pencil, just try to fill this out. And I am going to write one as well. And then I'm gonna share it with you. So just take a minute. Once upon a time, there was a blank. Every day, blank. One day, blank. Because of that, blank, period. Because of that, blank period until finally blank and ever since that day blank so if i were to do this right now once upon a time, there was a student. Every day, he went to school thinking he didn't belong and it was a waste of his time and his money. Because of that, he wanted to quit. Because of that, he had to go to talk to a counselor who suggested a career readiness course before he quit. Until finally, with the help of the career readiness teacher and the students in his class, he realized he had a talent and a skill in furniture refinishing. And ever since that day, he felt better about himself. That's just one story based on the uh, habitat example. If I were to flip that, and again, I just wrote these in like two seconds here. So if I were to flip that and put that as the perspective of the volunteer manager, it might sound something like this. Once upon a time, there was a volunteer manager at the Habitat Restore. Every day, the store advertised for volunteers at the local high school. One day, a new kid came in because he needed 40 hours to graduate. Does that sound familiar? 
Because of that, the volunteer manager had to keep him busy. Until finally, the volunteer manager was stressed because he had lots to do and to get ready for the charity auction. Until finally, the volunteer manager gave the young volunteer responsibility to support and refinish furniture for their auction to increase their sale materials. And ever since that day, the volunteer manager remembered the gift of 40, remembered the gift of 40 hours of volunteer work. So sometimes we can be surprised at what can happen when we least expect it. So take, I really suggest that you do this with just something really simple that you're trying to work through. And this might be a really good little exercise to uh, free you up a little bit and not worry about grammar, but just you'll get a little bit of a flow going that helps you. And always remember that ever since that day, um, I flubbed it up, but I couldn't read my writing here, but it was the 40 hours um, that helped. So go with that. Um, if you need resources, there's tons of things available now for resources so you can sketch out on a storyboard. I like to use old fashioned um, uh, film strips, but you can use Canva and things like that too. For example, they've got great storyboards for telling digital stories or just write, drawing out stories. I encourage you to always look for a story in your environment. So that's one of the best ways of being a storyteller is just to be able to look around you, to see what's around, to listen to people talking. When I was hired on to work on Morningside on CBC Radio, um, I had a fabulous producer named Neil Sandell. And uh, when he first asked me to do something, he said, uh, I want you to go and listen. I want you to go and listen at the coffee shop to hear what people are really talking about. And then we want you to go back and tell those stories to um, a national CBC audience. So it's all about not necessarily eavesdropping, but you want to get a sense of what your volunteers are talking about when they're having coffee. Um, what are some of the things that they see as opportunities um, that you can kind of build on the story. So always look for stories to be able to tell. Keep your notebook with you or your phone so you can just jot something down if something sparks an idea in you. Um, and listen to people. Listen all the time to what people do. Listen to podcasts. Listen to radio programs. To me, listening to words without seeing the person, it's harder, but you really need to focus and it can really make an impact for you. So, you know, yes, you can read, but the reason I put this screen up here is I do or I do write for a lot of magazines and you would never see a story like this in the magazine anymore because what they usually do is um, put it in with lots of photographs and sidebars. So I recognize that reading, we're not doing as much anymore. So don't worry about the long stories, but just recognize that what you can do with a sidebar can make more of an impact. So this is a story I did on a wonderful man named Eli Jacko in Thunder Bay, um, who's a community activist. Uh, but the story that centers out with Eli is just kind of the sidebar, the key points, the talking points perhaps that um, I wanted to share. And I recognize now that we're, we're in a, such a busy world that our concentration is probably not quite what it was years ago when we weren't so bombarded by information, but um, Eli takes it slow. And um, he says, good morning to people. That gives him the inspiration to keep walking. Uh, so recognize that um, maybe we have to connect like what Eli says is wanting to make a difference in the neighborhood by just one step at a time. And that again is the idea for storytelling is you can learn a lot about people if you go walking with them. So uh, if you have walking groups for your volunteers or any kind of um, fitness opportunities, um, again, great story generators.
I love blogging and I like the fact that if we coordinate or kind of look at editing our blog posts to 150 words, um, we can make an impact. Again, the fact is when you look at a blog, you see a photograph, again, something um, that inspires you and the whole idea with blogging, keeping it short, everything that you see now, editing and recognizing too that it goes back to that whole thing about the storytelling seven. Um, we have a lot that we say and when you start to just kind of say one thought per blog post, it can be a lot clearer for the reader. So, so this is about a kitchen dance party, but again, it's something that can be, you know, kind of um, incorporated into a volunteer project or um, a volunteer kind of fundraiser. How to dig deep for a volunteer story. Um, these are basics. If you're looking at for your volunteers or you're just um, thinking about what you can do for any kind of promotion or material that you're working on is to talk to people and to push yourself out of your comfort zone to talk to people that perhaps you wouldn't talk to before. And uh, uh, being a part-time broadcaster, that has been fantastic for me. I'm a naturally very shy person, but I feel that when I'm researching a story or trying to come up with something, I have so many, um, I have so much confidence that I'll go and talk to anybody. And surprisingly, people will talk to you. Um, but also, you're a good talker, but you need to listen. You need to be able to hear what people are asking you. One of the key things that I think is, is really important is if you can bring people together in a story circle. So perhaps you're working on an idea to get some new stories to share with your volunteer appreciation week. Um, bring the group together in a story circle, but be very respectful. And a story circle means that everyone around the circle has an opportunity to say something and that you say it at the particular um, one person speaks at a time before other people start to talk as well. So um, a respectful story, story circle can really be helpful. Um, to ask some probing questions if someone's really struggling with getting a story out or if you're struggling with getting some, ask yourself some probing questions. How can I get to the bottom of this? How can I um, ask my volunteers to help me kind of make things better? Um, one of the things that we did in a in a story circle that I put down here was celebrate great ideas with jazz hands applause. Like this is um, uh, for any of you who who um, know American Sign Language, um, applause is um, by you know um, or if you're a dancer, you know jazz hands is waving your hands. Um, so uh, instead of verbalizing your your support or clapping, this is a quiet way of of the person who's maybe telling the story getting some feedback and uh, you know if I could you know if I were able to connect with you guys and you gave me jazz hands I would feel like inspired to keep going on my story so um, I really encourage you to try that to try to work it out with a group of people it can be with your volunteers but it can also be a really great exercise to do um, with your professional um, uh, uh, team or the organizers you're working with on a particular project uh, is to let everybody in the circle have a chance to tell tell something and if you really like something do the jazz hands and support that person to keep going um, and just a couple of quick starter questions um, if you need that you you know you're interviewing a volunteer and you want to get something more out of them um, the best volunteer gig you've had, who is the biggest impact on your volunteer life, what unusual talent do you have, um, have you ever used it, has it helped you when you've been volunteering, what kind of volunteer job um, uh, should be created, uh, what would be a song that you would use as an anthem for your volunteer work, um, have you ever learned anything when you've been volunteering and what was that, this one I really like. Have you ever taught someone anything while you were volunteering and how did that make you feel? Um, put your own questions down here too, but just some of those things I think are really valuable to get the conversation going and to also, if you're listening to people, to, to be able to kind of scribe down some of those ideas so that you've got something to follow up on.
So just in summary, a story doesn't have to be long. Um, you can use one quote and that can be your story uh, with this great visual. Don't let fences stop you from meeting your neighbors, a community activist project. Um, on the right hand side is a teapot. One of my favorite volunteer experiences was working as a, a teletale club coordinator for um, a local uh, home for the aged and that was our teapot and that's how we gathered around for our, our uh, Saturday afternoon get-togethers. The quotes can actually take you so far. So if you're concerned about writing an entire story, listen to your volunteers or listen to other volunteer managers and find those quotes that really stand out for you. Um, here's a couple of our giants um, in Thunder Bay. This is Arlene. I call my friends when I need them. Don't be afraid to call people. And then John's quote here, if you're not connected to eight people, go get them. He really feels that you need eight people to connect in your community. So these are stories. And remember that even if you can't, you know, if you can't get the quote, the picture can say so much. Uh, the picture can mean so much to so many people that are interpreting the, quest, the picture. And then the last little bit here too is that um, stories are all around us. Um, this woman is one of the first um, uh, RNs in Northwestern Ontario to fly into lots of communities. Um, her name's Dolores Kivi, um, but she really believes in, in uh, the fact of oral histories and listening to people and sharing those stories. Um, but again, you can share them at a campfire, you can share them at the dinner table, uh, car rides when you're with people, at a volunteer celebration. I recognize that you need to listen, to look, to learn, to lead, and to lift. If you want to practice your stories, tell riddles. And that's a really good practice um, exercise to remember. Tell a folk tale or a fairy tale. And this is one of the key things, is not to read it, but to feel the story and to see it in your mind's eye and to share it with people that way. There are so many resources available right now for storytelling and storytelling has gone off in so many directions, but some of my favorites are on National Public Radio in the States. They have a program called StoryCorps that I just love. It's people um, doing little interviews like a mom and daughter interviewing each other or um, uh, you know a volunteer manager and a person who was a volunteer they're just like three minutes long they are so impactful um, the moth.org is another great uh, podcast and website um, to hear people's stories um, and there's so many more opportunities um, I also recommend that if you want to see storytellers live um, go to Storytellers of Canada site for some of their, the options that they do. In Toronto, they have the Storytellers um, Toronto site, and there's different places as well throughout the province that do that. And then if you want to see some of our age-friendly giants videos that um, our group made, um, our website is right there, www.agefriendlygiants.ca. So in closing, just... Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much again to Pavro for this opportunity. For me, um, stories is um, one of the ways that we learn about each other. We learn where we've come from. We learn where we're going and we connect with people and we never forget the stories that we continue to share. So even though that it might change a little bit in the telling, um, the fact that we are listening to each other's stories makes for um, a more exciting and a more compelling community. So thank you for listening. And uh, Joanne's put a notice up here. If you do have any questions, I'd love to take them or love to get some feedback on what you think you might be able to incorporate into your program. 
Okay, thank you so much for that, Nancy. That was great. Um, so we are taking questions. So we already have one question here. So someone's asking if you can just maybe elaborate a little bit more on how to use stories as a marketing strategy and when it comes to recruiting new volunteers, like perhaps like now with newcomer volunteers coming to Canada. Sure. Um, what I would suggest is um, uh, one of the, on, if you go to our age-friendly giant site, um, we have a fabulous story um, where Rozzy was um, a newcomer to Canada who came to Thunder Bay and worked in the Multicultural Association. Um, he came from Bangladesh and his uh, digital story that he, he wrote and produced was about um, making a new home for himself. And his story to me is one of the ones that, you know, kind of um, showcases that even though he's happy to be in Canada, his, his home is Bangladesh. But um, the pictures that he shows in his digital story are um, of how he's connected in his new community, his new home, with uh, helping to mentor uh, students in learning English. So it's a fabulous, um, um, it's a fabulous way for, um, you know, for people to recognize what Razi, um, you know, the journey that Razi's made, and also the fact that. Um, uh, you know, he connected with a, a, an organization that was able to maximize his skills because he was able to speak English and he was able to mentor other people in speaking English. And that made him feel like he was such a part of the community. Um, and what also was really neat about when Razi shared his story, a lot of the students from the ESL class at um, the Multicultural Center came to watch him present his story and they were kind of uh, welcomed by everybody else in the group. So I think that's really cool is to see uh, from a recruitment standpoint how that kind of um, feedback could be a really much bigger way for getting other people in the community to know about that. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. And uh, someone else is asking, is there an organization you can think of that has done like a really great job using uh, storytelling either like as a marketing strategy or to recruit volunteers or just in general, um, getting the proper message that they'd like out to the public? Um an organization that I can think of. Um, so first of all, you have to define what your proper message is. I think that's the thing. And I think what, what's really challenging is it's even when you have a picture, it can be interpreted in a variety of different ways. Um, so if I were to think of an organization off the top of my head right now, um, I think maybe I would just go back to our age-friendly giant site. Um, I, reckon, I really recommend that you look at it. Our cause is to uh, get people to connect with neighbors in Thunder Bay. So um, particularly getting people to remember that they're seniors um, in Thunder Bay. We have one of the highest percentages of seniors in Ontario and uh, many of them live alone in their own homes. So I think that's our message is just getting people to connect and to reduce social isolation. So I think what we're doing is a pretty neat way of um, taking quotes from people, getting the message out there, trying to do it subtly, but impactfully and, um, and letting people kind of talk about it. Mm -hmm. And just, I guess, one more question here where someone's asking about just how to build trust when it takes, um, it, I guess, getting people to trust you uh, with the stories that uh, they'd like to share. If there's any tips on maybe how to build that Definitely. Um, and again, it's the respect factor and recognizing that some people don't want to share a story um, and that's OK. Um, but building the trust is showing some of the resources that you've already developed, um, maybe having a testimonial from one of the volunteers that actually um, shared their story and what it meant to them. Not only, um, yeah, they were, you know, really great, but this is the kind of feedback I got from friends when they saw my story 
on TV. Um, this is the feedback, you know, this made me feel really good. My kids, you know, felt really proud of me. Um, you know, I've, I've done something that I never thought I could do. So I think that's, that's having some of those testimonials from when you do get people to trust you and you tell your story and you know they're happy with the way you've told their story. Um, that you can share that with somebody else that you're trying to encourage. And sometimes, especially for the more difficult stories and the more um, heartfelt stories, um, those are the ones that really make the impact too. So um, that's what we want to try to get out, but we need to kind of trust people to um, to do a good job with the story that you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's a good tip, Nancy. Well, we're just about at the end of our webinar, so I just want to say thank you so much for uh, for this presentation. I think this is so creative and has really given us a lot to think about and consider, um, and we can definitely apply this to our, our volunteer management strategies as well. Uh, so thank you so much. I want to say thank you to our members as well and to our guests for taking the time to spend with us today uh, for this webinar. So this will be available online. Uh, probably in the next week or so, we'll get that to you. And um, I'm sure Joanne will send an email saying that it's available. And again, if you have any questions that you think of afterwards, you can feel free to email uh, Pavro or email uh, Nancy as well and um, just get those questions out there. And I'm sure she'd be happy uh, to follow up with you. Um, so we're going to have another webinar again coming in October. So you should hear some more about that in the next month or so and we'll be sending a survey as well about uh, this webinar that you, you just uh, experienced today so thank you so much again and i hope you all have a really wonderful day thank you